Well, good morning, church. How are you doing? Good to see your smiling faces on such a lovely, bright day. Well, it is. The sun's shining in my heart, and Jesus is on the throne, and that's what matters. Look, we're going to come into his presence and praise the Lord. I want you uh, to just feel comfortable where you are. If you want to stand, stand. If you don't, well, that's all right. You can say, be seated. But join us in, in just uh, lifting up the name of the Lord and giving him glory. Amen? Amen. Come on, let's pray. You are the peace in my troubled sea, Lord. You are. 
the peace in my troubles be. you take your seats. We're just going to, I'm going to encourage you right now, I'm going to read a scripture and we're going to come to a time of communion. Pastor Heath's going to lead us in some communion. But um, why don't we just think about it? We're going to sing a song, the girl's going to sing a song. And we just, I just like you to think about why we do this and how Jesus has done so much for us. In Psalm chapter um, 3. In verse 1 it says, Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? Many are saying of me, God will not deliver me. Don't you like it in God's word when it has a but? But you, Lord, are a shield around me. My glory, the one who lifts my head high. I call out to the Lord and he answers me from his holy mountain. Father, we're so grateful that you sent Jesus. Lord, that you lift up our heads. That you surround us with your shields. And that no fall can come against us, Lord God. This morning, as we just think about what you did on Calvary, we are just so grateful, Father God. sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? 
Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. Lift Come to the place where God has made a difference. God's always been in charge, but he revealed himself supremely in Jesus with his intention. And whether you're here with us in the building today or whether you're online, you're invited to participate in communion. If you don't have uh, the little cup with the wafer, then uh, if you raise your hand, someone will bring it to you. But let's prepare by uh, tearing both the... uh, pieces of um, foil and plastic so that we might be ready. Today, the first Sunday of the month, we celebrate communion. It's also an opportunity for us to remind ourselves of our vision that we are joining with Jesus in the renewal of all things. One of the verses that says this so clearly is in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, where it says, Behold, in other words, pay attention to what God has done. 
It says, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has gone and the new has begun. That's what happens when we become people who are in Christ. And if we're not sure what that means, we're very thankful to Paul who went on straight away to say, for God himself was reconciling the world to himself through the death of his son. And then the last verse of 2 Corinthians 5 says, God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, that we might be the righteousness of God, that we might have the right relationship with God. That's the newness that God is bringing about in our lives. It begins as we turn to him in faith. It continues through our lifetime, and not just our lifetime, but through the lifetime of all of those of faith. And as we come to communion, we remember that Jesus gave himself for us, the one who knew no sin, he became sin for us. It's a quite a profound statement. But he did that so that you and I might be made new, that the old would go and the new would come. And we need to remember that and rejoice in that and know that that renewing continues on until the day that he returns. Jesus gave us this. On the night he was betrayed, he took the bread and broke it and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in memory of me. Let's eat the bread together. Father, we want to thank you for the body and the blood of Jesus. We thank you that he gave his own life so that we might know true life with you. We thank you that he took our sin upon himself, our rebellion, our rejection of you, and endured all of that for us so that we might have a right relationship with you. Thank you, Father that you can adopt us into your kingdom, into your family. Thank you that you are continually at work making us more like the Lord Jesus. And we thank you for your spirit empowering us as it did Jesus for ministry, that we might be those who go out and tell what you have done. Father, for the body of Jesus, for its brokenness, we thank you. Amen. It was after supper that Jesus took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, the new way of relating to God. Do this, all of you, in remembrance of me. As we prepare ourselves, we remember that Paul said that as often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we remember the Lord until he comes. So let's drink together. And Father, we want to thank you for the blood of Jesus. Precious is the flow that makes us as white as snow. We thank you that it has cleansed us and made us new. Help us to walk in newness of life, led by your Spirit and in step with the Spirit, that we might bring Jesus into our homes and Jesus into our workplaces and our neighbourhoods, that we might take Jesus wherever we may go so that more and more people might come to know him and join in your great adventure of renewing all things. We ask it for the glory of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Just a couple of quick things and then the kids are going to head out. Uh, first, straight after church today, we have a very short uh, meeting just to accept names for uh, deacon positions uh, in time for our AGM, so please be aware of that. A couple of things happening this week. Woman to Woman is on this coming Tuesday, so be in prayer for them and, of course, uh, attendance. Uh, it may or may not be raining. There may or may not be a boat ready to bring you to church. Uh, secondly, there is a working bee. 
I'm not sure how that's going to go next Saturday. I would wear Ugg boots or some kind of gum boots, perhaps, might be better. But next Saturday, if you want to help uh, tidy up the grounds and uh, you want to help, please speak to Bob. So they're the, the, the main things, and you can read the rest in our newsletter. If you don't get it online, please uh, make sure you give us your email address so that we can send it to you. Otherwise, uh, most of our things are going to be on the website. Have a look at that. And of course, lastly, to remind you about our offering, it's wonderful to have uh, people giving online. It's, uh, it's easy, it's helpful, and uh, it's just as important and worshipping God as it is to bring it here physically. But we know that there are those for whom that's uh, been a tradition for a long time, and we love to have you here with us. And so if you do bring your offering with you, just place it in the basket on the way into church. Well. We're going to head out with the kids, and while the kids head out, why not turn to those near you and say good day and ask how they're going? It's lovely to hear the chatter, but it's time to do some other things. As for a Bible reading this morning, it's a bit loud, um, taking it from Isaiah chapter 5, 25, sorry, verses 1 through to 9. Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name. For in perfect faithfulness you have done wonderful things, things planned long ago. You have made the city a heap of rubble and fortified towns a ruin. The foreigners' stronghold, a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will honour you. Cities of ruthless having trouble here, ruthless nations will never will revere you. You have, do you mind? Oops. I'll clean my glasses and I might be able to see. <laughs> Mucking me up. You have been a refuge for the, for the poor. A refuge I am really not seeing this morning. <laughs> a refuge for the needy in their distress. A shelter from the storm. 
and a shade from the heat. For the breath of the ruthless is like a, a storm, oh boy, driving against a wall. We're only going to go a bit further. Yeah, that's do right. it. That's right. I'll just yeah, I'm not seeing today. <laughs> Where, where's it up to? Um, yeah. So I'll go from verse 4, and you tell me when to stop, all right? You have been a refuge for the poor, a refuge for the needy in their distress, a shelter from the storm, and a shade from the heat. For the breath of the restless is like a storm driving against a wall, and like a heat, like the heat in the desert. Your silence, the uproar of foreigners, as heat is reduced by the shadows, of a cloud, so the songs of the roof, the song of the ruthless is stilled. More? Dead. Yep. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of, wit of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples and the sheet that covers all nations. He will be swallow. He will swallow up death forever. The Sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day, they will say, surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord, we trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Now my glasses are cleared up now. <laughs> Heat of the face. Right, let us take some time now in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are our God and we exalt you and praise your holy name. We thank you that we can bring all things to you in prayer. We thank you that you are always with us you promised that you would never leave us or forsake us, and we give thanks. We thank you, Father, that the privilege we have of being able to pray for one another. We thank you for the ministries that happen in this church during the week, for Kidscape, and for the new kids who came for the first time this year. And we just pray for Nico and Frederica and the others who work with these kids that you will bless them, you will strengthen them, and that, Father, the kids will be so happy to keep on coming and then they'll bring their friends. We well, thank you for this opportunity of sharing the good news of Jesus through young lives. And, Father, we thank you for the many ministry opportunities you have during the week, particularly this week with Woman to Woman on Tuesday, for seniors or wise on Wednesdays and the craft groups on Friday and youth groups and the young kids, little kids on, on Friday. And we just thank you, Lord, for this opportunity of reaching to people who don't, they know about you in some of the um, craft groups, but they're not all walking with you. And just pray, Father, that as they hear your word in these various activities, as it's shared, that you will speak to their hearts and you will challenge them to think seriously about where they stand with you and that there will be a strong hunger in their hearts to come to know you as their Lord and Saviour. Father, we look around the world and we see a lot of sadness, a lot of strife. And Father, our hearts go out to the people in the Ukraine What is happening there is just absolutely horrifying. But there are, in Ukraine, your people at work still. We thank you, Lord, for the missionaries who've gone and have into that country over the years and have worked with the local church and for the church that is already in the Ukraine area. But at this time, we think of workers that we know of or know about serving with OM Australia in Ukraine, and they are still there, seeking to reach out to the people, seeking to provide help and encouragement. And we pray, Lord, for them as they are very close to the very 
difficult areas in Ukraine, that you will keep them safe as they seek to honour you in their service to the people of Ukraine. And Father, it's indeed a privilege to pray for folk who are working here in Australia in your name. We think of Reese that we know and for others like him who are working in our universities across this nation. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity they have to share Christ on campuses and for the Christian students who get on board with the staff workers and share in that ministry. And Father, for, for some who are at uni, don't really know much about you, but we thank you, Lord, for Christian students who befriend them and who share the gospel. And we pray, Father, that through this ongoing ministry throughout our universities, that there will be many who will come to know you as their Lord and Saviour. And Father, for the, for the students who come in from overseas, countries where missionaries may not be able to go, we pray, Father, that they will find Christ whilst they are studying here in Australia and take the good news back to their own country. We remember, Father, for those within our church family who are not well at this time. We pray, Father, for a healing hand for them, for strength, and for the sure knowledge that, they, that you are with them, that they will know that and will lean on you and trust in you. In all these things we bring to you and through the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Peace. 
Wonderful. We're on? There we go. Do you want to move that to the side? Thanks, buddy. I'll just rearrange the furniture. Fantastic. Good morning. I know what it's like, Kath, when your glasses fog up, so you've got me hoping now mine don't, but uh, fantastic. Wonderful. Let's speak this morning on the subject of generations, generations, and uh, I've been thinking about this um, for a while now. Um, there's a lot happening in our church, isn't there? There's a lot happening in families uh, that are in our church and connected to our church. And I've been thinking about the generations in one respect, um, and I've shared this before. My father served in the British Army. He served in the Medical Corps uh, for a couple of years there. And um, I uh, attempted to follow in my father's footsteps. In fact, unknowingly, there's a lot of things that my dad did, who in many ways was a genuine hero to me and a great example and uh, there's many things that I tried to follow my dad in. My dad was a uh, professional footballer as you know, I tried that, I didn't quite make the, uh, the grade that my dad did, uh, I can't say I represented, uh, you know, played for Liverpool and played at Wembley like my dad. Uh, my dad was in the army, uh, I enlisted, I tried to enlist in the army but uh, I passed all the uh, academic uh, requirements and failed on the physical, which I thought it would be the other way around because I prided myself on my fitness and my health. But they told me that I was too small. And uh, so I remembered that. And I remember as I left the room after being, telling, being told by the sergeant, whoever it was, I said, uh, you want to hope that conscription doesn't come in in Australia because if I'm too small now, I'll be too small then. Um, but uh, my father did serve and my father was a professional artist, a painter. I, I tried to follow in his footsteps there. I did sell two paintings. Um, I think I got 20 bucks for them, but that's irrespective. <laughs> um, there was many other things. My dad was a musician. He played drums in a big band. Uh, I tried my hand at guitar, uh, Matt, not to your standard, but I, I gave it a lash. Um, but there are many things that my father achieved. And uh, I've been thinking about uh, my dad in the army because in two weeks' time, my eldest daughter, Courtney, some of you know her, she's 25, she starts her career in the army. So she's off to Wagga in two weeks' time. She's uh, accepted an offer. Uh, to be in the, uh, the area of communications and, uh, and uh, in fact, in the intelligence corps. And so uh, we're a bit nervous. Of course, my wife, if you know her, she's afraid that Courtney's going to be sent to the front line in Russia somewhere. Um, but I don't think that's going to happen. But she could be posted anywhere in the world after the initial first six months of training. And I've just been thinking about that in terms of the generations because I reminded my daughter, I said, Courtney, you know, your granddad served in the army. And she'd sort of forgotten that. And it was kind of like, wow, you know. Um, the generations, you know, and uh, it's interesting how that kind of unfolds in life, sometimes unknowingly, you know, we end up taking paths that generations before us have, have taken, and so it's, uh, we're a little bit fragile in our home at the moment, there's a few different changes happening, um, but uh, it's all good, but that song is a beautiful song, you know, I'll not be shaken, hallelujah, hallelujah. Anyway, so I may get emotional this morning talking about, emotion, uh, talking about emotions, talking about the generations, but uh, we'll see how we go. So this thought of generations, I don't have one text this morning, there are various scriptures that I'd like to read. To read. Uh, my understanding of the scriptures is that God is a generational God. And I believe a healthy, strong church is a generational church. A church that reflects and represents the many generations. And I think our church does that. And what a beautiful thing that is, you know, you, you can come here on Friday and see playtime, you know, little kids that are one year old, two year old, and, and then at the other end of the spectrum, woman to woman, the craft groups, you know, seniors, wise, you know, we've got this beautiful generational thing happening in our church. And, uh, you know, we're not only 127 year old, but we have this beautiful representation of the generations. And, uh, you know, I think one of the things is, uh, that we often think when we think of generations, we think of the up and coming generation, the next generation, and we can tend to focus on that. But um, I, I don't think that's the case. I think that, that, that a healthy, strong church has all of the generations and serving and loving Jesus together. And, uh, you know, the young and the old and the old and the young. And I think that's a beautiful thing. And uh, so I'd like to speak and, and preach into that this morning. So I'd like to share just uh, several scriptures uh, that touch on this theme of generations. Genesis chapter 9 is a beautiful story. Um, of course, we have the flood, uh, but uh, we also have the rainbow. And we have this rainbow that God sets in the sky. Uh, and the rainbow is a covenant. 
It's a covenant that God makes with himself and mankind to never flood the earth again. In fact, if you read the story, it says that God will see that rainbow and he will be reminded himself of the covenant that he made to never flood the earth again. But in verse 12 there, Genesis 9 verse 12, it says that it is a covenant, the rainbow as a covenant, it says for all generations to come. (laughs) You know, maybe you've seen the rainbow this week. It's God's rainbow, Um, despite what happened last night at the SCG and the rainbow that's taken there. The rainbow is God's rainbow. The colours of the rainbow are God's colours. It's God's rainbow. And it's this covenant that he makes for all generations that he will never flood the earth again. Genesis chapter 17 records this uh, amazing conversation between Abram and God. And here God, again, establishing a covenant with Abraham the covenant that he will be their God and that Abraham and the people will be, uh, God will be their God. God will be their God and, and we will refer to God as our God. And in verse seven there, it says, and this covenant, the covenant of God being our God. And of course, in that story there, uh, we are there. <laughs> uh, uh, the generations uh, uh, of, of as numerous as the sand, or the descendants there of Abraham, as numerous uh, as the sand. Of course, that was given to Abraham when he was without children. Uh, but this beautiful verse in verse 7, it says, and, and this covenant to be your God and you'll be my people is for all the generations to come. In Exodus chapter 3, we have again a conversation between God and Moses. You remember this conversation at the burning bush. And here we're introduced to God as the God of uh, our forefathers. In verse 6, he's a generational God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. This generational God. Of course, in this story, we're also introduced to God as the I am. (laughs) The I am. And God, of course, in that story, sends uh, Moses to Pharaoh. Of course, you know, let my people go. And uh, Moses says to God, who shall I say sent me? And God says, say that I am has sent you. (laughs) Imagine going to the Pharaoh, I am has sent me. (laughs) I am. And of course, in verse 15 there, it says um, that God says to Moses, this is my name forever. I am. This is my name forever. This is the name that you shall call me. What does it say? From generation to generation. Joshua chapter 3 and 4 is the story of the Israelites crossing the Jordan River. What a great miracle that was. And of course, when they get to the other side, Joshua orders a monument to be built. And you remember that story. They take 12 boulders from the sea there and they build this monument. And somebody asks the question, uh, what's the monument for? What's, what's this monument? These 12 stones representing the 12 tribes, of course. And in Joshua 4 and verse 6, it says, um, when future generations ask, what is these stones? What is this monument? You can tell them that God held back the waters. You can tell them that the Ark of the Covenant was able to cross over on dry land. When the generations to come ask. Psalm 78 records some of the mighty works of God's hands. It's a great psalm, Psalm 78. In verses 3 and 4, it says this, Things we have heard and known, things our ancestors have told us, we will not hide them from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord. We will tell the next generation of his power and the wonders that he has done. Two more references to generations. Ephesians, one from the New Testament. Ephesians 3.21 and uh, reading verses 14.21. It says there, To God be the glory for who he is and for what he has done and for what he will do in Christ Jesus throughout all the generations to come. And one more in Psalm 45. Psalm 145. And I'll read it. Psalm 145 says, I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. And in verse 13, it says, Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all 
generations. This theme, this thought of generations. I have three observations from these texts that I've just referred to. And the first one is this, that God is an everlasting generational God. He's an everlasting generational God. When you read the Bible with a generational mindset, you discover that God is both the God of every generation and he is the God to every generation. We know that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God does not change. He is everlasting, and he's an everlasting generational God. You know, the thing that I find interesting is that the same God, the same God that our forefathers loved, the same God that our forefathers obeyed, I'm talking about uh, the patriarchs, the same God that they loved and served and obeyed, and all of the stories associated with those patriarchs, the forefathers, are the same stories that we tell today. It's the same love that we have for God. It's the same steps of obedience we take. And it's the same stories. Right now, downstairs, I think he's still down there, he's telling the kids uh, about David. <laughs> and uh, downstairs, they're having a fresh look at some of the great characters in the Bible. But you know, those stories of David, David and Goliath, and David as king, and David as a songster, and a psalm writer, and, and yes, David the adulterer, and David the murderer, all of those stories about David, they've been told from one generation to the next, to the next generation, to the next generation. Those stories stand the test of time. God himself stands the test of time. He is everlasting, and he is a generational God. Is the same God with the same stories. We don't need new stories. <laughs> Those stories are powerful stories. Those stories uh, communicate the very nature and character of God, and they serve to inspire us as we, in this generation, love and serve God. There is not another God to come. <laughs> God is an everlasting and a generational God. Deuteronomy chapter 30 uh, carries this great story of, of Moses. And uh, I'll just refer to it rather than reading it. But in Deuteronomy 30 there, there's this command that Moses gives the people. And he says, today choose life. In fact, Moses says to the Israelites, I set before you the choice, choose life or death. Choose life, choose prosperity, or choose death and destruction. And Moses says, out of that choice that you will make, keep this in mind, that if you choose life, the generations to come will be blessed. The generations to come will be blessed. The generations to come will live long in the promised land if you choose life. Of course, to choose life is to choose to honor God. To choose life is to choose to love and serve God. Eventually, the Israelites <laughs> chose well and entered the promised land, not without some struggle. But God is an everlasting, generational God. The second observation I make on this theme of generations is that God is a conversational, generational God. It's interesting when you read these passages uh, that refer to the generations that they are uh, uh, enveloped, if you like, with this conversation. Conversation. God having conversation with Noah about the generations. God having a conversation with Abram, with Moses, with Joshua, with Esther. All of these accounts of the generations are surrounded by conversation. It's a conversation that God's having. Psalm 145 that we read is an example of this. This passage in, in, in Psalm 145 is a mandate for generational interaction. The design of it, if you read Psalm 45, the design of it is it starts with a, a commendation, a declaration, a, a meditation to speak and, and to declare and to pour out and to sing aloud about this generational God. If you read it there, Psalm 45, it's filled with vivid verbs that call us to action, that call us to interact with the generations. We are to declare God's work. We are to proclaim God's greatness. 
There is that sense of public praise for the things that God has done, the things that we've seen and heard about God. We are to give him praise for that. All of the generations praising him together. Psalm 145 here is a generational cycle. It's the older to the younger and the younger to the older. This generational praise, this generational honor of God. I believe that the biblical duty of every generation is to ensure that the next generation hears of the mighty acts of God, hears of the mighty power of God. These biblical stories, and together with our personal testimonies, is what we pass to the next generation or another generation, one that perhaps has gone before us as well as the one coming behind us. You know, we're in the middle of, and we're taking a break for a moment, but we're in the middle of a series, Heath and I, where we're, we've set out the table and we're having a look at the, the conversations that Jesus has around tables. This is an interesting thought, that we can have these conversations about generations around the table. <laughs> conversations about the generations. God is a conversational, generational God. The third observation and final observation this morning is that God builds generationally. God is building his church generation to generation to generation. In fact, as you read the Bible, you discover that God builds in three ways. He builds revelationally, line upon line, precept upon precept, truth upon truth upon truth. God builds relationally. He came preaching a gospel of relationship. Interesting, when he chose his disciples, there was family members that were chosen. But God also builds generationally, one generation to another. Now, the book of Acts records the day of Pentecost, uh, the birth of the church, as we refer to it as. And the interesting thing is that the, the church was birthed by the generations and the nations coming together in unity. This was the birth of the church. Many, many, many nations represented on the day of Pentecost, and many generations represented on the day of Pentecost. Allow me for a moment just to read Acts chapter 2 and reading from verse 14. It says this, Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, are we living in the last days? <laughs> we are. In the last days, God says, God says, this is what will happen. I want you to catch this. He says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. We're seeing them today. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But I want you to notice here how the generations are engaged in the last days. It's generational. Sons and daughters, young men, old men. Of course, it's not gender-based. It's the young and the old. It's the male and the female. All of us, the servants, and everyone has the spirit poured out upon them and the opportunity to exercise the giftings that God's given us. This is what the end time church looks like. It's prophetic for the end time church that all of the generations will serve and love God together. All of the generations, the young, the old, the old, the young, the black, the white, <laughs> the new, the older in faith, all of the generations coming together and being empowered by the Spirit to love and serve God and one another. It's a beautiful picture. It's a beautiful picture of our church, 
of all the generations, loving God together and serving God together and proclaiming His great and mighty power and all of His works and all of His deeds. You know, over the last couple of weeks, I have to tell you, Nico and Frederica, I was really moved by what you shared the other week. You know, the numbers are important, but they're not the main thing. But to have 31, you know, primary school kids, 10 visitors, only two from the church, that's a testimony. That's something to give God praise for. Not that we boast about that, but God is doing something in that generation. You know, I love it when I get the opportunity to come and share a devotion at the craft group and, and, the, and the woman to woman. God is doing something in that generation. You know, playtime, uh, Beth tells me that there was 23 mums with all the kids, one and two years old. God's doing something in that generation, in that ministry. You know, I loved it this morning when we, when we stand here and, and we can look at the generations, younger and, and, and older, in, in the creative ministry. One of those ministries in the church where all the generations can come and serve together. What a beautiful picture that is. When I first came to our church, and I closed with this thought, I, I, I was introduced to this thought, and I'm just going to bear my heart here for a moment. I was introduced to this thought of silos. And there was some conversation that was happening that, that in our church, we, some of the ministries are silos. In other words, they stand alone and they do their own thing. And, you know, I, I, it didn't sit well with me. I'm not used to that. Not that language, nor seeing that. And maybe there are reasons for that. But, you know, now two years on, I, I, I don't actually think that's the case. I don't think that's the case at all. I think we've got so many beautiful ministries in our church that are reaching different generations. And God is at work in that. But this is what I do want to encourage us in church, in that we ought to be celebrating that. Yes, we have to know and hear the stories, and, and we get that through the testimonies of Nico last week, but we ought to seek out those stories and embrace the work that God's doing in the generations in our church and declare that and shout that from the rooftops, what God is doing amongst us. It serves to encourage us, and it serves as a witness to God and His work amongst us and beyond. Because the reality is, and maybe one of the reasons we think of some ministries being silo, is because a lot of what happens in our church does not happen on Sunday. We don't see it. We can see the creative, you can see the preachers, you know, um, but, but we don't see playtime on a Friday morning. We might not see the youth group on Friday night. We might not see Kidscape on that second fortnight on Friday. We might not see wise. We might not see, um, I mean, you know, for us as men, we, we, we're not part of woman to woman. But, but God is at work in the generations. That excites me. <laughs> that excites me to be a part of a generational church whose ministries are touching the generations, those that have gone before and those that are coming up next. But here's my final thought to us. We discover in relation to the generations that we have a choice. In Judges chapter 2 and 6 through to 13, we discover a lost generation. It doesn't tell us how a generation was lost. It just tells us that a generation was lost. One generation stopped speaking about God, stopped the conversations about God. And the Bible tells us there that a generation was lost. I don't know if you've ever seen that, a generation that's lost. It's very sad. Conversation, as simple as conversation stopping, can lose a generation. The choice is ours. But then to contrast that with Acts 13, 36, which says of David that he served his generation well. So we have a choice, church. Keep the conversation going about God and what he's doing amongst the generations or stop the conversation and lose a generation. Or we can set in our hearts to be like David and serve our generation and the generations well and not lose a generation.
There are many churches around the world where generations have been lost. Perhaps there's many reasons for it, but perhaps one of the reasons could be that the conversations stopped and we got caught up in ourself rather than what God is doing and wants to do. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you're a generational God. There are so many examples and illustrations of you at work, one generation to the next, to the next, to the next. We thank you that the generation we live in now, you're wanting to pour out your spirit. We thank you, Lord, that in your heart, in your eyes, in your sight, you desire that no generation would be lost and that all generations would have the opportunity to come and to know you. We pray that you would help us at MCC to keep conversations about the generations and what God has done in the past, what God is doing now, and what God you want to do in the future. Help us to keep those conversations alive so that we don't lose a generation. Thank you for being our God. Thank you that we have the opportunity to be your people here at MCC. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. God bless you, team.
and your children, children and the children and the children may his be upon you in a thousand generations and your family and your children and the children and the children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in his coming and you're going in your weeping and rejoicing he is for you 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 I like that word, amen. <laughs> I believe it. That's what it means. Hey, that was cool, hey? Not knowing what I was speaking, choosing that song about the generations. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm going to pray, then we're going to stay where we are. We're going to go straight into this short meeting that I believe is going to take 15 seconds. So, um, <laughs> Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity of being able to be together and, uh, and also to experience your presence amongst us through the worship and through the ministry of the word. Pray, Lord, that you'll be with us as we step into this short meeting now. Uh, may your will be done in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. So why don't you have a seat? And uh, I'm not sure how this plays out. I'll turn to Craig. Okay, there you go.